What's going on, smart people? I have a lot of classical mechanics I want to get done, and it's all on rigid body motion and the inertia tensor. So I figured as a good exercise for me, and to make this day productive with today's video, I'd show you how to derive the inertia tensor. We're gonna do this by considering angular momentum of a rigid body, and then we're going to collect some terms that look similar, put them all in a matrix, and that'll be what we call the inertia tensor. The first thing, is let's just define total angular momentum. If we have a whole bunch of rigidly connected points, the total angular momentum L, we know is just R cross P. Okay, and if we have this weird collection of points, here's the point that our body is rotating about, and here's another point that we're interested, which is like the ith particle, the velocity of this particle is going to be due to that rotation as a whole. In other words, we can express, we know that P is just the mass of the ith particle times the velocity of the ith particle, but the velocity due to that rotation is just the cross product between the angular velocity and the radius vector of that ith particle. So this should be, I mean, if, if they're perpendicular to each other, you get the very familiar V is equal to omega r. But that's, it doesn't have to be that way, so this would be much more general. Then we can substitute all of this into this definition of angular momentum, and we get something kind of gross, where L is equal to mi ri cross omega cross ri. So we've got a double cross product. Um, I'm going to go ahead and index this, just to be clear. So this is the total angular momentum. We're summing over i, we're summing all over all of our masses. The next thing that I want to do is I don't want to have to be considering double cross products the entire time, so we're going to expand this. If you already know how to expand a double cross product, you can probably just skip to the next part of this video, or if you're just not interested and you want to look it up anyways instead of going through this, be my guest, but I'm going to show you how to expand this in terms of the levi civita symbol. So for regular cross product, if we have, say, some vector v cross w, we can find the ith component of this cross product and say that that is epsilon ijk vj wk. So this is important. And then if we have the product of two Levi Civita symbols, so epsilon ijk, say epsilon ilm, we can expand this in terms of Kronecker deltas. This is just delta jl delta km minus delta jm delta kl. So this is important. This is all that we need in order to expand this double product. So let's go ahead and do that. If I want to talk about the ith component, let's drop the i index and then we'll, we'll, we'll tack it back on eventually. Um, this, this index is not for a component of a vector. It's just saying, you know, for the ith particle. So let's forget about that for now. Let's just consider this cross product, this double cross product, r cross omega cross r. Okay, and I'm going to look at the ith component of this. Well, based on this, I need the Levi Civita symbol, and that's the thing that's the first index is not to be summed over. So epsilon i j k. The j goes with the first vector, so it's this one. So that's going to be an r j. But then we also have another cross product here, but this is going to have to reduce to the kth component. So the kth component has to survive. So we'll call this uh, epsilon klm omega l rm. Okay? And now we have a product of two Levi Civita symbols. So this is just epsilon ijk epsilon klm r j omega l r m these indices don't match up quite we need to sh we need to permute one of these such that the first index is uh is matched so we can turn this i j k into a k i j epsilon k i j epsilon k l m r j omega l R M. If you haven't seen uh, cross products in terms of the Levi Civita symbol before, I have a video on it, which I'll link in the description. But it's super important. I think it's really helpful to be able to expand things this way because it speeds up the process a bit. It might not look that way because we're dealing with a double cross product, but I promise it does. So let's go ahead and expand this. This is just delta I L 
delta j m r j w l r m delta i m delta j l Now, if we look at this, we're saying that L has to equal I, J has to equal M, so let's go ahead and substitute this stuff in. We're looking for the ith component, so we're going to keep I. So this is just equal. If L equals I, then this L index is now going to be an I, so that's an omega I. And that J equals M, so we've got an RJ and an RM. We'll call those both J's now. RJ, RJ. Now M equals I, so it's RI. And then L and J must be equal, so that's R, J, W, J. Now, so this is, this is describing the components. Um, now we can describe the entire vector. Now this, this generalizes to the entire vector. If we have two repeated indices, that's just a dot product because we're matching components here and multiplying them together. So for the entire vector, this must now be equal to omega vector r dot r, which is just r squared. Actually, I'm going to write the r squared first, just for clarity. Omega. And now we're taking the dot product between r and omega, because these are, these are the same index. So this is minus r, r dot omega. And that's how you expand this, this double product. So let's go ahead and substitute this back in here, and we get that l is equal to M I, and we'll go ahead and uh, consider, you know, that we have different particles. So we'll do R I squared omega minus R I R I dot omega. Perfect. We're getting there. This is now what we need to start deriving the components of the inertia tensor. Now what I want to do is I want to consider the x component of this angular momentum, of this total angular momentum. So the way that we can do that is we can just take the dot product between L and the x basis vector. So L sub x is just L dot E sub x, which is equal to mi ri squared omega minus ri ri dot omega dot e sub x. And then let's just distribute this out. So this is just equal to mi ri squared omega dot e sub x minus, I'm going to pull this forward because this is just a number, um, but there's also an m that distributes, minus mi ri dot omega ri dot e sub x. So all I did here was I distributed the mi and take the dot product between each part here. The dot product between e sub x and omega is just going to give us the x component of the angular velocity. So this is just equal to, yeah, it's right here, mi ri squared omega x minus mi ri dot omega. This is just a scalar. And then this is going to give us, uh, we'll call it x sub i. So if it was the y component, we call it y sub i. So ri dot e sub x, we'll call that x sub i. x sub i. Last but not least, we can distribute this dot product out. So we're going to take the, the components of r and the components of omega and multiply them out. So we get that l, l sub x is equal to mi ri squared omega x minus mi, the first component is going to be just x sub i, this is going to be omega x, so x i omega x x i minus m i y i omega y x i minus m i z i omega z x i. Okay, let's see, well right here we have a common factor of mi and omega x, so we can factor that out, and we get that lx is equal to mi ri squared minus xi squared omega x, so that's just this component, 
And then we've got these terms. Minus mi, yi. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this around just a little bit. I want the x to show up first just to make things um, more suggestive. So it'll be mi, xi, yi, omega y minus mi, xi, zi, omega z. Okay, I know that this looks a little complicated, but we're basically done. One thing to note is that if we would have done L sub y instead of L sub x or L sub z, a similar thing, a very similar thing would have happened. If we take a look at this, there's a pattern. We've got x in each term here, and then it goes x, y, z. If we were to have done L sub y, y would have been in each term, and it would have gone x, y, z. So this is very predictable, and to save some marker, we can define these terms. So we can identify this term here, which would show up in each of the components of angular momentum. If it was L sub y, this would be a y instead, though. This is just i sub xx. So the, the indices correspond to which component you're seeing in this term. So since we see x twice, we call that ixx. We call this term here uh, ixy, because we have an x and a y, and we're absorbing this minus into it. And then we call this term here, since there's an x and a z, we call that ixz. We would have had a very similar behavior for the other components. But this allows us to simplify our equation a bit to now we can just say that L sub x is equal to I sub x. Let's call it, uh, we're going to sum over I, I suppose, omega I. So if we were summing over i, this gives us i x x omega x plus i x y omega y plus i x z omega z, which is exactly what we have here. And then if we were to want to do the L sub y component, that would just give us i y i omega i, which would give us i y x omega x. Okay, and then if we were to collect all of these, these coefficients that we're seeing here, we can put them and gather them into a square matrix. So we can define something that we can call I, big I. Sometimes you might see it with a little double arrow on it. That's equal to the collection of all of these coefficients. So we've got I, X, X, I, X, Y, I, X, Z, dot, 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 I, uh, Z, Z, y, y, and we call this matrix the inertia tensor. And what this whole thing allows you to simplify this entire expression even further to where now we can write angular momentum as the following. L vector is equal to I omega vector. And this makes it super suggestive. Writing it in this linear algebra notation makes it glaringly obvious that there's a connection between angular momentum and angular velocity. And that connection is a linear transformation that is made possible through the inertia tensor. So that's basically it, but you guys don't look satisfied. You look like you want some closed form expression for these matrix elements. So let's go ahead and, and assume that our rigid body, instead of having discrete points, it's more of a, like a continuous mass distribution. So we can describe these masses M is equal to, you know, its density, the density of this mass distribution times the volume. So if we want to describe, say, the inertia tensor, the component of the inertia tensor, say I, I, J, where we have a continuous mass distribution, then we can integrate instead of summing over it. So we're summing over this density and now we need to be able to turn on and off these different components. And the best way to do that is by introducing the Kronecker delta. So we can describe this as r squared delta ij minus xi xj. Then we're integrating over this volume. Now let's take a look at this for a second. If i equals j, then this Kronecker delta is just 1, and we get r squared 
xi, xi, or xi squared, which is this term. If delta, or if i does not equal j, then this term goes to zero, and we get the mass times minus this uh, xi, xj, which is exactly what these terms are. So we can pick out a specific component of the inertia tensor through this relationship here. And this is exactly what you would end up using if you wanted to calculate moments of inertia for different geometric objects, like if you wanted to do it for a thin rod or something like that. One last thing that I want to point out is uh, some properties of this inertia tensor. Namely, we showed that ixy is just minus mi xi yi. Uh, if we were to calculate i y x, that would just equal minus m i y i x i, which is equal to minus m i x i y i, because these are just numbers, these are just components of the vector. But what that tells you is that i x y and i y x are equal. And this will happen for all of your uh, components where you just switch rows with columns. And whenever you have a matrix slash tensor that does this, you can call it a symmetric tensor. So it means if you switch the rows and columns, you get the same thing. But that's it, guys. That's the derivation. I hope it wasn't too painful. Let me know in the comment section if you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you there.